are listening to the True Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. God said, let there be a dome in the middle of the water. Let it divide the water from the water. God made the dome and divided the water under the dome from the water above the dome. That is how it was, and God called the dome sky. So there was evening and there was morning, a second day. The complete Jewish Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed, and I have as co-host with me today, Kathy Dunson. Kathy, are you there, sister? I am. Hi. Excellent. Well, thank you for... Uh, I'm glad that we have a, a chance to uh, collaborate in this way again. Um, we've had so many guests on for so long, it's I almost forgot what it's like to, to do shows like this, you know, where we can just kind of... Um, comment on current events and just you know let spirit lead discussion it's um it's very cool i it's wonderful and and i've been uh delving into your book thank you very much for sending me a first draft and uh it's been a busy week with uh this other uh video out there now about the no force but i've been going between your book and and that and so much of course going on in our world it's been quite a time. Yeah, it's a definitely interesting time that we're living in, especially with all the uh, the market uncertainty as well. But um, yes, the whole video, and I didn't get a chance to to watch all of it yet. I um, actually just moments ago um, published and released a link. Uh, I haven't released it to the public yet, but I did get through that final proofread, uh, which I know I'm still going to um, look at the material and make sure that all the chapters and everything are in the way that I want with this, my 10th book, The Firmament, The Vaulted Dome of the Earth. Those of you that follow my work know that I've been uh, diligently daily working uh, on this endeavor to try to get it ready for publication and I had to separate out some material on paradise and the sides of the north just because it ended up being so very extensive it's um currently 454 pages and that's minus eight chapters which I had to take out um wow that's a lot <laughs> yeah it's a lot of material but if I would have included all of that, it would have been in excess of 700 pages. Right. Which, it, yeah. That's daunting to people. It's I, scary. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm uh, about halfway through it now myself. It's, it's really, um, I, I mean, it's jam-packed. And there has been a lot of uh, confirmation to me beyond, I mean, I have been studying the flat earth and, and all things because it encompasses so much. So much I mean, right. you're relearning what you've learned and, and trying to make sense and keep up with everything else that's new coming out. Um, there's been just a lot in your book that, you know, I thought I, I knew so much. I knew that it, it wouldn't, you know, it would be true that, that there'd be so much. I mean, there was some revelation to me. I just stopped and, and had to, to, you know, wipe a, a few tears because it was just so wonderful. Um, I mean, the uh, not wonderful that it's happening, but wonderful that it's being exposed and, yes, yes. and to recognize it. And it, it also um, piggyback. I kind of hate to even say the, the particular thing that just really gripped me. Because I want everybody to be led along as reader, as I felt I was. But um, piggybacking with your previous book, um, right. um, Flat Earth, Key to Decrypt, the Book of Enoch, you know, I saw in that how Satan had usurped the calendar yes. and God's feast days and uh, right. times and seasons that, you know, we don't even know where people, you know, think the Sabbath is 
Saturday or, you know, the church observes on Sunday, it's really none of the above, you know? And so right. between that and, and, uh, this book, it's just been quite, quite a time. I mean, it's, it's really exciting. It was, uh, it was that way for me too, in writing the material and studying and, uh, cause so many revelations connected to each one. I mean, the whole thing with the calendar system and the, you know, all the, the appointed times, the Moedim, all of that being changed. I mean, that was something that I had no idea would come out of studying uh, how the flat earth connects to uh, the book of Enoch, the specifically the portion on the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries. And um, in decrypting all of that material uh, by applying the flat earth as um, basically skeleton key for unlocking the motions being described by Enoch of the sun and the moon and the other celestial luminaries between the six gates of heaven. Uh, and for those that don't know what I'm talking about, um, there's videos on my Endeavor Freedom um, YouTube channel which explain this. Um, but for great detail, you would most certainly have to revisit the, my book, The Flat Earth as Key to D. Crypt the Book of Enoch because I break down all of those particular chapters and, and every passage from that portion of the Book of Enoch, uh, the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries in that text. But I had no idea in studying that that it would tie to the calendar system. And like, you know, the show that I just did this past Wednesday talking about the Exodus and un uniting the revelation of you know, because God changed the calendar then and gave it to reintroduce um, the Enochian ancient Hebrew lunar solar calendar to the Israelites, to Moses, and gave it to them during the Exodus, established the feast and uh, the festivals, the holy days, uh, according to the way that the calendar system is laid out. And, um, you know, again, in reading all of that material, I had no idea that the you know that this calendar system um, was given to the, to the people and reestablished in that way and and it's just like in reading Genesis all the the numerous times that I had previous to the study of the flat earth and also the vaulted dome, uh, I just kind of breezed through it, you know, never even second guessed what I was reading and the material that I was looking at, but just read through it and just continued on. But now in having re-examined all of that material and with a very inquisitive eye with relation to how it ties together with the concepts that we've been discussing and studying over the past couple of years now, um, it's mind-blowing the revelations that are brought forth when you have the eyes to see, you know, the ears to hear and the mind to understand. So revisiting. I, uh, yeah, go ahead, Kat. Well, I likened seeing the, um, the obviousness of flat earth or the vaulted dome, the firmament in the Old Testament or throughout the Bible now as to how we see and recognize Yeshua throughout mm -hmm. the Old Testament. Right. I mean, it's so clearly there, I mean, but I, I didn't see it that way before, but now I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. So um, in having gone through, you said, half of the book now, um, I wanted to ask you what you thought about the way that I aligned all of the Genesis narratives from all of the many different, um, the canonical and uh, the extra biblical books, all of the, because so many are not even familiar with a lot of those books specifically. Um, one that I found just absolutely mind blowing was the, the Chronicles of Jeremiel and the just extensive amount of information that is covered in that particular book that connects to uh, what we're talking about as far as the four, first four days of creation and specific to uh, the firmament. Um, it, I, I was really blown away. I really did like how you did that. It, it's kind of like another layer to um, digging in and um, understanding Strong's concordance right. uh, or another concordance 
um, breakdown of the Hebrew words, and you've also included the Targum text. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think that that helps um, really solidify and, and illuminate the entire entirety of a passage. I also liked how you explain kind of like a detective um, taking all of the information if you're going to forensically right. look at, at something. And, and that's how you've approached um, understanding what a verse is about or understand bringing the other text into play here. You know, I, I think that's really important for people to understand when they discount it so quickly. You know, tr the Bible is truth, but not all truth is in the Bible. Right. When you read other information. There was information in that day that um, gave um, more um, understanding in, in their day, how they were living, like the Targums. It, it yes. just gives more understanding to what was going on. The Bible brings everything succinctly in, you know, such a, 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 a short, you know, amount of, of um, pages, literature. It, it, there's, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Right. And, I, and I think people, when they um, won't look at other texts, they're short, short, circuiting themselves on being able to understand the fullness. I think um, a, a verse that always spoke to me and from a very early age was Isaiah 118, where God was saying, come, let us reason together. And I think part of that is, is looking at everything that's available. You right. know, you may not consider something inspired and, and, you know, I'd like to understand better even, even some, um, how the canon was put together. Uh, yes, me too. We, you know, it, people it spent a lot of time arguing about it. <laughs> and I wish right. people would spend more time learning. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, um, and, you know, that was one of the reasons why I went into the whole thing of, like, if you're going to approach a crime scene or, like, you're a, an investigator or somebody that's trying to, um, discover in fullness about a specific event, how you take every bit of evidence and then you create a timeline and then you insert as much of that evidence into it and then try to then come to discernment on truth and how things happened. Um, that with this particular narrative, that that's how I wanted to approach it because I'm, I'm – you know, been studying the extra biblical materials for decades now, several decades. And be that's one of the things that m makes my research so unique is because I do and have studied so much of the material in, in the extra biblical text, which a lot of people have never even heard about, uh, never even had chance to read. And then m my being able to pull from all of that material in being familiar with it, uh, it gives me a completely different perspective on a lot of topics which in the canon that remain ambiguous and that are not clearly defined. And I know that a lot of people, especially those that are, you know, King James Version only uh, readers or purely King James purists and that they won't go outside of the canon in reading any other material, and a lot of them, you know, consider doing so to be blasphemy or heresy. Um, but that when you do so, a lot of things that, like I said, remain ambiguous within the canon, they, they become clearly defined, especially when you study and read the fullness of the extensive amount of material that are out there. And of course, I'm not in any way asserting that all of that material is in any way inspired. But this research and also with um, the Flat Earth my, in my previous book, there seems to be many of these texts are indeed, in my opinion, inspired because they affirm this same biblical narrative, which has been hidden, lost as knowledge, you know, as, as wisdom for at least the last half millennia. Uh, for the last 500 years um, in our in humanity's 
embrace and buying into the whole Darwinian heliocentric worldview, which now in um, in challenging all that and looking at very carefully with almost a magnifying glass at the uh, the biblical narrative and especially the Genesis account, I've learned so much new revelation which absolutely affirms the veracity of not only the biblical assertion that the you know that we live in a geocentric uh, uh, a geocentric worldview um, and that the earth is stationary and unmoving. Uh, but that it is covered in canopy, in heavenly canopy. And uh, these two things completely challenge the whole narrative of, you know, that we live on a, a spherical earth and that we're spinning on an axis as we annually orbit around the sun. And the whole thing of the celestial luminaries being entered into the firmament, and which is fitted to and placed above uh, the earth and encapsulates the earth. Those are things which um, now in looking at, you know, going out every day and looking at the motions of how the sun and the moon move in sky and how it connects to the calendar and the system and all of that, I'm just absolutely blown away by the profundity of the revelation which has been given to me in regard to all of these things and uh, it's well, increased my relationship with the most high go ahead Kathy well and see that in itself is inspiration from the most high and I think that um, we discount the ability that he has given us to connect the dots to to look at the vast wealth of antiquity um, works that come from, I mean, Flavius Josephus, you've included information from him. I, I mean, he was a rabbi, wasn't he a rabbi? And uh, the study, the historical information that he had, um, right. there's, there's so much information that's available that we uh, can connect the information together. It's kind of like how I connect news stories and, right. and I try and take inspiration from the father to bring forth, you know, this is kind of what I see is on the geopolitical scene today and, and is worthy for us to pay attention to. I think uh, that, I mean, people are inspired by prophecy and vision today. And so to look at some of these extra biblical texts and say, well, those aren't inspiration. That's, you know, trying to pigeonhole it into the canon and say, it's one thing when, you know, it still uh, deserves our attention. I, I know for myself, you know, I've always been so interested in historical information and and meeting up with you and your information and your books and your teachings and uh, what you'd put together for study. Um, that, that opened up an entirely different world for me and, and one that I was so excited to jump into and to learn even more. And I think that's true of a lot of people, people who aren't even aware, um, you know, like jumping in with the Nephilim. I know a lot of people will come across L.A. Marzulli or Tom Horn, and it opens up an entire new world for them where the churches, I think that they teach behavior. I'm not sure that they are really teaching the fullness of Scripture where you can see God at work, His plan for the world coming to a fruition, you know, at this point in time. It's it's a different kind of... Um, a, a, I didn't, I don't know really what to term it, but it's it's like layers and and um, understanding. I know it just opens up a whole new thing. I I, I believe reading your uh, your I think it's your fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain. I just could see everything from the beginning to the end coming together, and it right. made such sense to me. Right. It it reminds me of um, the three book series that Dr. Joy just released and how she had prayed um, to God to give her the title. And he, you know, he told her um, beguiled. The series is called beguiled from Eden to Armageddon. And so it 
ties together the beginning with the ending and everything in between. And it's my opinion that unless one has discernment on the beginning, it's most certainly difficult to understand how um, you know it ties to the end. And so um, with the whole thing of Dr. Joy and her new three-book series, is she does the same thing that I do in the books that I write and leading people through the fullness of the story, um, beginning with the war in heaven and even, you know, connecting our own preexistence and uh, our predestination and all of that to the fall of humanity, uh, our exile here, even our incarnation into flesh form now, all of those things, um, there's so much to the story, and it, like my books are little skeleton keys for unlocking different aspects of the uh, the gospel narrative, the secrets that are contained within that most people don't understand. And uh, individuals like Gary Wayne and others that are doing similar type of research, where they're looking at everything in order to get a better grasp of how the ancient mysteries tied together with the prophetic word, um, the oral traditions of humanity uh, worldwide, um, you know, the legends of things like Atlantis. I mean, all of that, when you have and understand the underlying truth of how all those things connect, they fit together to form a huge uh, puzzle of truth, which is just mind-blowing to uh, come to discernment on. Absolutely. I know when um, I was younger, I was a, a huge fan of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, and it was their science fiction with a uh, Christian underlying theme that really attracted me, but yet it was still science fiction in that realm. And so um, stepping over into reading what uh, L.A. Marzulli had and then finding you, that was we, that was based upon the truth. That was based upon information that had been uh, withheld from me. And so I think it's really important, especially at this time, uh, exposing what has been sold to us as the truth, which is a lie. I, it, it's so easy to see as you pull away the layers. I mean, yes. it's called heliocentrism for right. crying out loud. Right. You know, the things that um, are so obvious to you and I after this journey of a little over a year or longer for you, um, it's it's um, something that I just, I can't see how I didn't see it. Yes. Yes. Uh, and now, yeah, and having... It's been two years for me now, but uh, in having come this far, I, you know, looking back, I can't even remember what it was like to not know these things and how seemingly lost I was. Because, you know, I thought I had learned so much in my journey even to that that point, but these two huge pieces of the puzzle being uh, thrown atop all of that other material that I learned about is just, I mean, I had no idea that there would be deeply paradigm shifting revelations like this still out there yet to discover. I mean, <laughs> well, and it is such a huge, all encompassing thing from, you know, scripture to empirical evidence, looking at the sun and realizing it's not 93 million miles away. It It isn't something that um, a person can expect to learn, you know, immediately. <laughs> you have to dedicate yourself to, to look into it, to um, ask the serious questions and, and not be afraid of where it's going to go. It's exposing Satan, and that to me is, is why I think it's so important. It's lie and deception in and. and God is about the truth. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, for those uh, that say that the the flat earth and the vaulted dome as topics are not important and that they are just a distraction, you know, there's so many verses in the scripture about just teaching truth. And these concepts are absolutely 
important and very relevant when you come to understanding on them because the not only evolution but the whole thing with uh, uh, the heliocentricity and how that ties together with the ancient alien theory um, and that there are multiple Earths and you know that there are alien life forms and that these fallen angels are from other planets out there. I mean, there's so many lies built upon lies, built upon lies, which we have been indoctrinated into and have absorbed and embraced without ever second guessing or ever challenging the premise of all of that thought that is brought, you know, we're forced to reassess all of that. And um, it, it's certainly been a mind blowing journey, but we'll be right back, everyone. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, And for those that, you know, have been waiting and looking forward to the the release of this book, I did post a link in the chat room. I've gotten it to the point where I feel comfortable uh, releasing it to the public. Um, I I always have a tendency to go back and keep reading over um, my books just to make sure that they are fine tuned, but um, I've done now like six proofreads, and so um, I, I believe I have ironed out of the the book most of the errors, and there might be one or two, but I will still continue to um, to go through it with a, a fine tooth comb to make sure that everything is correct in the way that I want to present it, but. I know so many are um, have been asking me repeatedly uh, as to when I am going to release it. And so I've gotten it to that point now. Um, but certainly, you know, it, it wouldn't hurt to wait another week. Um, but again, it, it's it's very extensive amount of material. And, um, and huh, it, I think it is going to be definitely a mind blower for those that are interested in this as topic and that in my opinion, there's uh, well, I know I have not been able to find or in searching and looking for books on the firmament um, and specifically on the vaulted dome of the earth. I've not run across any that are written from the perspective of a geocentric earth. There is one out there and I think it's called um, the firmament the vaulted sky dome or something of that nature. But in looking at the contents of it, um, it is written from a heliocentrist point of view, which how you can write a book about, you know, the firmament when from that particular perspective uh, doesn't make sense to me. But um, Kathy, I know that there was some current events and some news stories that I wanted to, to bring forth before going into greater detail on this particular book project. And also I'm going to talk about um, that other material that I will be releasing on the paradise and the sides of the North, because that as revelation too is huge in and of itself. But Awesome. Um, I wanted to mention, I am sending out a usually twice daily newsletter and if anyone is interested in getting on that list please email me at paralandra77 at gmail.com that's p-e-r-e-l-a-n-d-r-a-7-7 at gmail.com it's kind of gotten into the no forest video and got that's off my truly interesting. <laughs> Yes, it is. And I got out of my groove. And and so I, I haven't sent one out. And it really kind of hit me that if I don't keep right at it, you know, kind of compiling information as I go through, you know, my feeds and whatnot, it just gets behind me. So anyway, I wanted to mention to people, one of the best resources that I have is X-22 Report. Um, his name is Dave. I don't know his last name. But I, he um, has the stories that I will share or I get stories from him. And I think the two reports he puts out each day are a great way, if you have no other way to keep up with what's going on in the news, 
to be aware of where we are right now. I'll just do a couple of um, titles he did recently. Um, today was, there are signs that the U.S. government is preparing to lock down America. The job numbers are not what you think. The economy accelerates to the downside. Election systems to be treated as critical infrastructure during a cyber attack. And Obama authorizes 30 days of bombing. That was for Syria. And he did that as soon as Congress left. So that's a great way to keep up. Um, also, Venezuela. Uh, there's an article by Michael Snyder out. And I've seen several things leading to this right now. The economic collapse in Venezuela is so bad that people are slaughtering and eating zoo animals. And so this crazy. It, it is. It's really bad. Um, people have been going across the border in droves to try and, and get food. Um, Zen, I don't know if you saw this because you've been kind of buried, but this is very telling. There was a, a, an audit. Um, the Army and Defense Finance and Accounting Service. Uh, well, let me see. Okay. The Army General Fund couldn't account for $6.5 trillion dollars in the 2015 budget audit. And if you, you all will remember back to right before 9-11, it was actually September 10, that uh, Donald Rumsfeld came out and said that they couldn't account for $2.3 trillion. So this is really telling, it, and I don't think I heard of it, but, you know, one or two places. Um Okay, then the other big news this week is the Zika virus. They're spraying in Florida, and there's a chemical in that that um, is very dangerous. There's uh, some stories today just came out in the Activist Post. It's titled, Before America Wanted to Eradicate Them, the U.S. Military Was Weaponizing the Zika Mosquito. Um, and also, be, I think most people are aware that the Rockefeller Foundation has been involved in the research, and they originally harvested and, and isolated the virus. It's been around for 70 years, but now they're also uh, spraying residents in, in Florida, and they've uh, the people in Florida have, have been really against this. Um, I'm not sure where it was exactly, um, Puerto Rico perhaps, where they actually uh, got that, you know, they shouted it down. They weren't going to put up with it then we've Good got the, yeah, we've got the olympics opening in rio um, i was going to ask you about that did you I, get a chance to see and what would because I, I haven't up, i haven't but i did come up with uh, two videos uh a call for an uprising youtube channel put out one and it it looks really good i saw the first five minutes of it it looks really good it's called Rio Olympics 2016 Opening Ceremony Illuminati Exposed. But it, it went through a lot of it. Um, I did see one short that um, he said they started out with giant bugs that look like spiders. And why they would start their opening ceremony with a bug, considering the Zika uh, scare that's going on and it's in Rio. I mean, in the past, I've read stories, too, about dead bodies in the waterways where they're going to be holding Olympic events. So it's uh, something to be watching. Um, okay, then the other really big news this week was... Um, Deaths related to the Clintons, there have been within six weeks, five deaths. And these wow. are these are big, you know, names. The lead attorney in the anti-Clinton DNC fraud case was found dead. And this was on August 2nd. And he's the one who actually served uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz with the lawsuit on that. Then also there was uh, John Ash, who was a UN, UN official who allegedly crushed his own throat while lifting weights. Oh so, my gosh. right, there's five people that they list in this one article. And I was going to mention to people there is a uh, internet, internet website called the Nakama List. N a c h u m l i s t. If you Google Google the Hillary Clinton Deadpool, 
it will come up and it's quite extensive. There's also one for Obama. And the other big news that I was looking at, because there's several stories that just connect together, but it's nuclear related. There was a story yesterday at Zero Hedge and it's titled Vladimir Putin just issued a chilling warning to the United States. And um, the United States really is ramping up and pushing on the bear, Russia. Um, what do they say? How do we? Oh, wait. Um, I'll just read this real quick. As the United States continues to develop and upgrade their nuclear weapons capabilities at an alarming rate, America's ruling class refuses to heed warnings from President Vladimir Putin that Russia will respond as necessary. In his most recent attempt to warn his Western counterparts about the impending danger of a new nuclear arms race, Putin told the heads of large foreign companies and business associations that Russia is aware of the United States' plans for nuclear hegemony. He was speaking at the 20th St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. We know year by year what will happen, and they know that we know. So this, there's also an article that was at Devka file. Iran could have an operational nuke by 2017 end. That is out today. Um, there was one other. The U.S. begins upgrading its nuclear bomb arsenal. And that they say it's out to 2020, but, you know, who knows? The fact that it's in the news is really something, but then it's not in the mainstream news. It's only... I mean, this I think I got from a, a Japan source. So that was what I wanted to highlight today. Well, I'll definitely have to look at the um, – because it always seems like the the Olympic opening ceremony and also the Super Bowl ceremonies that they are always Illuminati messages to world or ritual in some manner. So – um yeah the definitely video i that. put in in this little note um that i put together for the show today that one video is in there from a call for an uprising so that would be a good place to start with that yeah so we'll talk more about that um perhaps next week but uh, i wanted to give you a chance to talk about this um no trees video no no forests on the flat earth. Okay, because this is mind-blowing, and I've only, I think I've gotten about halfway through it, but enough to see the connections with what he's talking about, and, um, you know, as far as on a, a smaller scale, with the organic remains of the fossilized, the petrified forests, and then his connections to some of these mountains, like, specifically the Devil's Tower. So can you um, share with the listening audience links to that and then also talk about it a little bit because it's another, again, another one of th those things. If he's correct, this is like hidden in plain sight. and Exactly. And, you know, again. More lies. <laughs> yeah, more lies and absolutely mind-blowing revelation, which all of us have looked at and seen uh, these different mountains, but never have ever thought about it in the way that he's presenting it, in, you know, in this video, which is, again, absolutely mind blowing in its postulation. Well, I have the uh, the link pulled up for um, Mark Sargent uploaded it. I also uploaded it, and my channel is called Tribulation Now. But if you do a search on no forests on flat earth, you will find it. His name is David in Cyrillic. And so I don't know how you search that. But um, the language is a little difficult. I've listened to it three times now. And when I put on my headphones <laughs> the last time, it was really easy to understand. And, and you've got the concepts. I know the first time I listened to it, I was a little frustrated. But I, I was seeing things that were really striking a chord. And I thought, I'm just, you know, I'm going to get through this. And so um, do hang in there with it if you haven't watched it yet. And Zen, put the headphones on. <laughs> That'll out. But my uh, thoughts were going to, well, like we were saying, you know, lies. Of course, you know, after the flat earth, I'm 
not uh, discounting that they would lie to us about anything so grand. Seeing him point out the shapes and and uh, the sizes of um, mesas and, and buttes that could be looked at as looking like a tree stump. And then also I was connecting to the book of Enoch. I'm not sure the timelines. This is where I really wanted input from you at some point. Um, the giants they're describing as being 3,000 L's in height. And I've always seen that discounted that there there must be an error right. there. Right. right. But with this, that makes it totally believable. And then I also, I mean, I just have had a lot of, you know, uh, different uh, word salad. <laughs> I don't know why that came up. But I, I mean, I, like I, was, that, actually. <laughs> I was thinking back to the garden. I mean, how tall were the trees? I mean, right. I hadn't even considered that before. And then last night, I watched again the movie Avatar, and it started out with a scene showing a huge excavation, uh, a quarry, like um, he, David keeps saying. And I love he says, who cutted? All <laughs> uh, right. Who cutted the trees? And um, then the next scene was showing one of those machines, one of those huge machines. And the um, connection to the trees and to um, being able to share through the root structure electrically. I mean, we're, we've been learning about the electric universe, considering that over, say, gravity. And then just today, and the Lord works like this with me, I came across an article um, and it says human cells found to have electric fields as powerful as lightning bolts. And so it, wow. it got in. Yeah. So that was an interesting connection. Um, other things. Oh, I was looking at Mesa. You know, mesas are formed by erosion. This is the official story from National Geographic. Looking at the pictures that he shows, how is this flattened, you know, level piece of huge land formed by erosion and that goes back to millions and millions of years you know the things that we've accepted and not question um i was also watching a video there's a, you know there's been a few hangouts talking about this in um, more depth and this is called when giants roamed the flat earth and um the channel is flat earth conspiracy this is Lori and Lawrence and uh, Ronnie, event skeptic, was on there, and they had some really great points. One thing that I really uh, thought was Im important: um, volcanoes are being used like gravity. You know, if, uh, if you right. look at these pictures, you know they're saying these perfectly uh, shaped, as if it came off of a mill or lathe. Hex hexagon uh, hexagonal hexagonal yeah. hexagonal. Thank you. Shape. Uh, Devil's Tower with it um, coming down and curving where I'd never seen that before. And this one that's in, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, Giant's Causeway. And right. they you put that next to what they say caused it, you know, lava flow. And that's totally unbelievable. And I don't know if anyone else has connected this and or if you've ever seen this. Uh, I think it was in 2013, they, for the first time, imaged a molecule, a molecule and have a, like a photo of it. And it's also a, hex, a hexagon shaped. Mm -hmm. So like the honeycomb, and that's um, a shape that he's suggesting that's a living organism. So that's real interesting to consider. I'll shut right. up for a second. Right. Uh, no, I actually I wanted to ask you about uh, the the particular. Um, it was like a lake, uh, the residue, the hexagonal, the, you know, the patterns. Um, yeah, can you? That's the one that we. Uh, yeah, I, I pulled that out for this. That's the one that we often refer to for flat Earth because it's right. such a large expanse that's perfectly flat, Solar de Uni, and he. 
suggest that that wasn't because uh, his friend um, says that all of these salt lakes are really just leftover waste. But he said he disagreed on that because you can see these honeycomb shapes. And he suggests that that's also a living organism. So. Uh, yeah. And so, um, you know, that makes me think about in the in the Bible and especially in some of the extra biblical texts that talk about Leviathan and behemoth and how these are huge, you know, very huge living creatures, but yet, um, you know, it's not something that we're all been witness to or have seen, but it made me think about that as far as, um, you know, whether that was like the surface, the skin of some kind of living creature or, you know, I, I didn't know how to really take that or apply it, but his connections to this hexagonal shape and that as being, you know, uh, something that had once lived a living well, organism, I mean, certainly makes you consider, you know, think about what, what, what could it be, you know? He showed where, and I don't understand exactly silicone-based life forms to the carbon-based life form. Now I will be studying geology and all of that. I mean, we've been studying astronomy. Right, right, you yeah. You know, it's, it's really intensive what we're coming upon. But he showed, um, looking at the uh, Giant's Causeway, I believe, or else the Devil's Tower, how there's a, a fascia covering of uh, the stone, well, stone itself. And it's kind of like a membrane. And so, you know, he was looking at those different organisms. So, I mean, I picked up those things on like the second and third watch of the video. But um, what I thought was most interesting and where you would certainly have some input was that to me, because he was talking at another point um, after the quarry and, and the shapes about um, some a destruction and thinking right. about the tree stumps and the size of them and that these were giants would this not be the age prior to Genesis 1-2 where yes. in the antediluvian age and right. see that was part of what and I love this that you included it in the book about the firmament you went very much in depth about uh, Genesis 1, 1, 2, about chaos and that it was, the world was without form and, and void. void. Right. And that to me speaks of, you know, cataclysm before and what occurred then, you know, and, and I mean, there's just so many different things to think of. I can see that, if there was this huge mining operation going on, you know, there was a substance they were trying to get for what purpose? I don't know. I mean, could that have been gold? I mean, that's been discussed a lot among people. And I can also just see Satan doing it just to spite God and mm -hmm. to be destructive to the earth. Right. Yeah. We, we don't know exactly, uh, but certainly, in looking at and doing the the in depth analysis as far as looking at the strongs and looking at those particular terms, um, I think I laid it out in a way that uh, people in reading the first three chapters and let me just expound a little bit upon this. Um, in the first three chapters of this new book, I go into great detail uh, on the investigation of Genesis one one and. Genesis 1-2, because it speaks about the creation of the heavens and the earth, but then in Genesis 1-2, it speaks about the earth as being, uh, the earth was without form and void. And then when you actually go into and look at the the Hebrew words, tohu va bohu, which are the Hebrew terms for without form and void, um, it tells you that the earth became an indistinguishable ruin, a deserted wasteland. And so God didn't create it 
in that particular manner, but that it ended up somehow becoming as such. And uh, Gary and I, we you know did a, a number of um, really in-depth interviews where we talked about this particular premise, but I go to very great lengths in those first three chapters speaking about this as event and also in tying it to the creation of the firmament because the uh, premise that I put forth in this particular book is that the firmament was created as an impenetrable indestructible uh, barrier in order to create um, to imprison the fallen angels who were cast out uh, interestingly it, on that same particular day, according to uh, the book of the Secrets of Enoch, that they were cast out of the heavens on the second day. And that's the day also that we see the firmament being established and being fitted to and created as barrier um, encapsulating the earth. And so my whole postulation in this particular, these first three chapters, is that the war in heaven and the rebellion of the rebel angels against the Most High God, and specifically on the unveiling and the um, the dominion of the Son, Yeshua, Yahushua, uh, we're already at break. All right, we'll be right back, and I'll elaborate a little bit more. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. Um, I'm going to tell you the names of the first three chapters and then talk about this uh, a little bit more. Um, Chapter one is, and the primeval earth was a formless wasteland and undistinguishable ruin, which is the, when you take the keywords and look them up in the Strong's Concordance, this is the meaning of that particular verse in Genesis uh, 1, 2, where it talks about, and the earth was without form and void. Again, it means, and the primeval earth was a formless wasteland and undistinguishable ruin. Uh, The second chapter is the war in heaven and the antediluvian age. Chapter 3 is, remember from whence thou art fallen. And so specifically... The verse, uh, in a few other particular versions of the Bible, because in looking at different verses and also different passages, uh, which I'm going to ask you what you thought about that as well, Kathy, but um, I include multiple biblical translations in order that people can get a really firm grasp on um, how... The, you know, both the Targum and all of these other multiple versions, how they relate a specific passage. And just to give you an idea, um, in looking at verse 1 1 and 1 2 uh, from Genesis, the International Standard Version, it reads like this In the beginning, God created the universe when the earth was as yet unformed and desolate, with the surface of the ocean depths shrouded in darkness, and while the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The American Standard Version reads as this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was waste and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. All right, just a couple more. The Darby Bible translation reads as this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was waste and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Uh, One final point. Translation from the Targum, it reads as this. At the beginning, Min Avala, the Lord created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a vacancy and desolation, 
solitary of the sons of men, and void of every animal, and darkness was upon the face of the abyss. And the spirit of mercies from before the Lord breathed upon the face of the waters. In wisdom the Lord created, and the earth was vacancy and desolation. This is uh, the Jerusalem Targum. The first was the Palestinian, this is the Jerusalem. In wisdom the Lord created, and the earth was vacancy and desolation, and solitary of the sons of men, and void of every animal, and the spirit of mercies from before the Lord breathed upon the face of the waters. And so I'll read the King James real quick. Um, From the King James, it reads as this, the one that most people are familiar with. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so I broke down, well, not only do I include all these multiple biblical translations to give people a a full summation of how different um, translators interpreted those particular verses. But it seems to me that in every rendition, um, no matter that most certainly the earth wasn't, in my opinion, created in this desolate manner, but became that way. And so the question arises as to what led the earth to become in such manner. And uh, Kathy, you were talking about how this connects to what we see in that particular video with, you know, these, if these are tree stumps. Well, first off, what does that say? uh, If these mountains are in fact, you know, tree stumps, what does that say about the person that cut them down, uh, you know, the size of the individual that would have to, you know, the stature uh, that they, how big they would have to be in order to accomplish that, but also with the destruction, you know, that we see uh, in looking at the world, and because he he found remnants of this all over the world, um, and, and exactly what does that signify? And so, um, let me get you to comment on that. And also, if you would, uh, just comment on what you thought about me including all of these multiple biblical renderings and translations um, in order to provide, you know, what I think is a, a better way of looking at a verse in order to get a better understanding of it. I think that's the best way to study overall and you know perhaps some people aren't accustomed to that and this is a good opportunity to to actually see and and compare contrast um i think it gives a, a fullness to the the understanding that you wouldn't have if you if you read just one translation and going through the Strong's uh, understanding of the words is extremely important as well. I, you know, I used to read the Amplified Bible a lot, and that kind of does the same thing, although not nearly to this level. I think it's extremely important. I'm so glad you did. Um, I got a new appreciation for the New American Standard Bible because there was one passage that you had that they were the only ones that actually, I think it was the dome fitted the yeah. word troop. Yeah. Amos was, nine, six. Yeah. Yes. That was it. That was very interesting. So I think, I think in, in normal study um, that you do much better using, we have these tools available using some of these website tools. Blue letter Bible is one that I yes. use. Uh, Bible Hub is yes. another where you can just you know easily compare them. I I don't feel like I'm studying unless I'm I'm using those. And you can then quickly also go to the definitions at Strong's. Um, and you, I mean, you can learn so much. So I think that that was absolutely pivotal for what you were bringing forth. Um, one thing with this video. I think it's going to be really important because I think there's truth there. I mean, I had a lot of confirmation that was coming from my spirit and I don't discount that, 
there, I mean, I, and I don't look at what other people's opinions are to form my own opinion. I'm trying to look at, um, things with fresh eyes yes. after, after seeing what's going on with our world and coming to understand that first biblically having that foundation as the measuring tool, you know, what is going on here? I still have people, well, of course, who say, you know, the earth's a sphere and that's, you know, Isaiah forty twenty two. It's, it's definitely not. And there's, that's not the support. The Bible does not support a sphere and it, it never did. And for people to say that now, that's the indoctrination because right. scholars before didn't claim that the Bible you know, supported the sphere earth. They said that the people didn't understand what it was. So anyway, so I think it's really important now with this to look at a timeline. And that's where I really want to get your input. I, um, I immediately thought of, you know, Genesis one, two and the chaos in, and prior before that, I see now some people are saying, it would be the flood, and they're stuck in the young earth, I think. Right, right. So yes. they're not seeing the antediluvian prior times, but yet something else that you do um, a lot of study with here is um, Atlantis, and you've done that in the past. Lemuria, um, but it's Josephus, is it, who's written about that too? Plato wrote yes. about Atlantis? Okay. So I think that Finding a timeline there and, and looking at it with new eyes might really um, show us some things that we hadn't thought about before. The Sumerian Kings list, I was trying to find that, the timing involved there. And looking at the fallen angels and, and you know, are there heights of giants that were pre, um, you know, Genesis 1, 1 and 2 that we maybe haven't looked at before. Right, right. Yeah, there's a lot to consider when you come to discernment on the antediluvian age. And you're right, so many, I would say most mainstream Christians, um, not having looked at these particular verses in great depth, they affirm a young earth. You know, they only believe in the last 6,000 years, which is the modern era, uh, you know, modern humanity, Adam and Eve. But yet, as I lay out in this particular book, that when you really examine uh, verses um, Genesis 1-1 and the 1-2, in what people call the gap theory, there absolutely seems to be affirmed in the biblical narrative that there was this prior time, this antediluvian age. And we don't know how long that was and how much time had passed, but it seems to assert that whatever, um, however long that particular period of time was, that it led to the earth becoming destroyed, becoming waste uh, or without form and void. And that... Um, and of course, you know, we know about the war in heaven, which I take all of that um, and the much study that I've done on the war in heaven because uh, it was as topic of great interest to me anyways. And then uh, being able to apply all of that information to the possibility and the the whole premise that that's what led to uh, the earth becoming without form and void. And then, again, um, in showing that, you know, the rebel angels were cast out of the heavens, according to the second book of Enoch, the book of the secrets of Enoch, on the second day, and then you have um, modern humanity coming, Adam and Eve being brought up and cast out of paradise on the sixth day. And so this from the second to the sixth day, you have the fallen angels previously being exiled here to the earth and that they were here long before we were. Um, if you consider, you know, that, um, say, the the sixth day, if you consider that's going to be like, 
you know, a 6,000 year time period. Um, and, and that the millennial reign together with that will be uh, a 7,000 year span. Who knows how long a time from the, you know, is representative from the second to the sixth day. Um, and we don't even know if that is like, you know, each one of those days is equivalent in a certain kind of way. We just know that it adds up to a very long period of time. And then taken into account as confirming witness, things like uh, Barosis and Mantheo and the um, the Sumerian kings list, um, all of this, um, the, it certainly seems that there was a huge period of time that is not accounted for by those that are proponents of a young earth. And then the whole archaeological, geological record, um, the fact that we see entire huge megalithic city complexes at the bottoms of the oceans um, and that they had to have been constructed at a time when the those particular areas were above sea level uh, and not submerged in the manner that we see them reflected in this day and age, that that most certainly postulates that they were built at a time in the very far distant past. And so again, the all of these things in my mind, and as as you talked about, I show um, in these first three chapters, I bring out a lot of uh, extra, not even biblical text, but just um, legendary accounts from like Plato and even the Colburn Bible, the Emerald Tablets of Toth, um, that talk about the destruction of Atlantis and the diaspora that took place um, after and information from individuals like James Churchward uh, who talked about Mu as the motherland, as the original civilization and um, how the uh, the Nikal, the, the tablets about the Nikal as a people, that they also affirm this kind of diaspora um you know taking all of these things together as confirming witness to um that there was this prior time this previous age it all connects uh, to the affirmations that are in the bible and that when you understand them this way that the biblical uh, the prophecies and the teachings that are contained within the scriptures align with and affirm the ancient mysteries and the oral traditions, the mythologies, the histories of people worldwide, which speak about all of these things. And, you know, for those that are young earth proponents, um, there's so much you have to ignore and exclude and just kind of throw out the window uh, in order to hold on to those kind of belief systems, those kind of theories. And yet, Again, when you really investigate the scriptures in the way that I lay out and share within the first three chapters of this book, um, then it helps you to understand and tie together the underlying truth that we see um, confirmed in the archaeological and geological record with the premise that is laid out in the scriptures. And so uh, there's no, you know, it's it's not that you have to accept it one way or the other, that there is a unification that comes forward when you truly have the eyes to see, the uh, ears to hear, and the mind to understand, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. A unification with what we see with our eyes, the the uh, cities, the uh, foundations that are under the, under the sea, and what we see above ground and um, the mythologies. I think it's really important because it does work in the biblical narrative. And that's where so many um, have question or, or discount the Bible is because they aren't, they aren't taught any of that. And, and I think it's, yes. it's, it's not that um, we are glomming onto the scientific data in a way that, you know, 
some the fantastical part of it comes through. I think it's, you know, there are some things obviously that, that we can experience ourselves and understand and that it, it all does fit together. And, and the records that exist, you know, people are, are always saying that, you know, the Bible isn't the oldest text that's, that's out there. Well, you know, there, there's a, a continuity with the Bible with what um, texts were before, and, and you could speak to that better than I can. But, um, oh, I did want to mention one thing in relation to uh, this, this video about the giants in First Enoch 7. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the verse is here, but, I, you know, they were talking about the giants were devouring, eating um, the men. Uh, the giants turned against them in order to devour men yes, and they uh-huh. began to sin against birds, against animals, against reptiles and against fish. And they devoured one another's flesh and drank the blood from it. And then it says, then the earth complained about the lawless ones. Right. And so, you know, there's a lot going on with the giants that we don't really think about. And, and maybe there was a time when they were so, so large that trees were so large and and destroyed so right yeah we don't know and it certainly you know this particular video certainly makes us have to um reassess all that and to revisit it in uh, in postulation and then you know like like the whole uh the story of the giants being three thousand l's in height well looking at some of this evidence makes that uh, seem very plausible, you know? Right. Well, and then the uh, building of the pyramids. Um, right. The giants that I think we've, we've heard talked about have never looked to me as, as the ones who could have done all that. You know, maybe. Right. I don't I don't know. I'm just, I'm seeing after a couple of days of looking at this that there are a lot of questions again. And, yes. And, and we've accepted at face value without questioning you know, volcanoes did this. I never looked at Devil's Tower. I, you know, I I thought it was just, you know, a, a leveled off um, mountain. Right. And, <laughs> you know, now we're we're questioning everything. Miss um, B was looking at mountain in the Bible, you know, and and finding out a lot of other things. So there's a lot to look at in Scripture. There's, you know, volcanoes. It occurred to me that. You know, there's a lot going on there. If, as this man is postulating that they were part of waste product, you know, that made me think of compost heaps. You know, how they smolder and burn within. Even uh-huh. the science experiments, where you know, in uh, elementary school they make a little volcano. <laughs> so you know, it's it's just you know, there's a lot to think about. Right. Yeah. There is, and and now that you know, I have. Um, and you have, and so many others have, completely revisited the the story of creation, um, and that we know that it is n- no way um, as NASA asserts or as science uh, has been trying to, um, you know, basically lead us into believing, and which so many of us have. I mean, goodness, none of us, um, even you know, two years ago ever second guessed any of these things but now in this information coming to light once more and the most i is certainly bringing all of this to um to light once more in order in, in my opinion to destroy the whole uh thing of you know lucifer and his annunciations to be like the most high the replacement of the calendar system the replacement of the earth, uh, the geocentric earth, and uh, the the placement of sun as the you know a new arrangement as the uh, preeminent focus of a new heliocentric worldview. I mean, all of these things are part of that whole um, his declaration to, that he's going to uh, ascend into the heavens and replace um, you know place his throne and, and and take over the throne of the. Most High God, all of these things are, in my opinion, part of his efforts to do just that. And that the New World Order, scientism as a New World Order religion, that all of that is part and parcel to this whole um, 
d- d- opening us up to being receptive to those deceptions. And, uh, you know, it certainly seems most bewildering for those that have not ever considered it or thought about this in that way. But um, it's the but, only way to explain it, really. Well, it was like with uh, the Flat Earth um, and, and now this one. When I see people who previously, you know, they they are not uh, biblically oriented, they're not uh, Christians, they are going immediately to the Bible. Or previously with the uh, Flat Earth, they were going to the Book of Enoch. And, and that's what they are talking about, this uh, one video from Flat Earth Conspiracy. They are falling back on, well, what does it say in the Bible? So that's why I think it's really important for information that you bring forth that uh, we, we're able to, to bring that out and, and have people to consider, you know, this is what is really going on, the fullness thereof. There was chaos. It was a wasteland. That, to me, was a connection right away to what he was saying. I'm not sure what he meant about 1816 and some kind of nuclear event, but I definitely saw immediately, you know, that there was something going on that was antediluvian time. Right. Yeah, and I think that when you um, are brought to such discernment, you're able to look at a lot of things that otherwise don't make sense or that, you know, people, again, that only believe in uh, a young earth or that there's only been um, the unfolding of 6,000 years as far as the timeline of creation – that you are able to embrace so many other things that you would have had to ignore or just right. completely exclude um, in order to hold on to such belief system, you know, and that oftentimes people will do that. They will avoid certain areas of knowledge or certain We aren't teaching. supposed to know that now. That's, right. That's a statement that, you know, I always thought that, well, we're just not yes, supposed yes. to know about that. <laughs> Right. Oh, my goodness. This show's going by so fast. All right. We'll be right with everybody for a final segment. All right. Welcome back, everybody, for final segment. I want to open up this particular portion with um, a reading, just a few paragraphs from one of the last chapters of this particular book, um, which it's tied to what we were talking about before we went to break, and then I'll get Kathy to comment on this. Um, It says this. All of these scientifically speculative assumptions are laid to rest once one realizes that according to Genesis' order of creation and the biblical cosmology, that all of the heavenly luminaries, including every so-called planet, are nothing more than water and light, according to Scripture that in the whole of the cosmos there is no other object like that of the earth with a physical composition that allows for the kind of terraform we see evident upon the earth, that such landscape is unique from any of the other heavenly luminaries found within the universal creation. In my opinion, the scriptures affirm that there are no other physical earth-like bodies in creation, which in makeup can serve as foundation and place of habitation for the many creatures created by God for dwelling upon and within it. These realizations force one to reconsider all that which we had been taught in school as the gospel truth conclusively shreds the worldview espoused by NASA and the scientific community as universal reality. Much of what is everywhere perpetuated as scientific truth is nothing more than lies built upon lies built upon lies. That the grand deception as web of deceit was laid to ensnare the masses into incorporating scientism as belief and teaching. The flat earth and vaulted dome as revelation are, however, dismantling the goals, efforts, and plans of Lucifer the rebel angels, and those secret societies which are aligned to the agenda of the New World Order in bringing forth science as world religion for purpose 
of introducing Apollyon Abaddon as the Antichrist God. This information corroborates the veracity of the Bible's thousands of years old prophecies passed down by the early Hebraic forefathers and that these gospel secrets had to have been divinely inspired for how else otherwise can one explain its deception, uh, its depiction of the earth as flat circular plane encapsulated by heavenly canopy. The enclosed world system as structural truth, having been lost to humanity for hundreds of years, is coming forth again as scientific and historical proposition because it is needed now more than ever. The truth is restoring hope in people that were once militant, and I'm thinking of David Wise here in, in his, you know, that interview that he did, but uh, he said, in restoring hope in people that were once militant atheists as described by their own words, to recognition that the Bible had to have uh, been influenced by what had to be the same being that established our own world and our place within it, the Almighty God. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Kathy? Amen. <laughs> um I wanted to, um, I, I've been listening to some of David, David's uh, interviews with Madison Star Moon, I think. And he reiterates in that how, you know, he was, he was an atheist before. She says, are you an atheist? I was. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> right it, you can't uh, know this uh, truth of the flat earth and remain an atheist. I mean, if you if you do, that's really ignoring the facts. Right. So I think that's really important. Um, I, I was thinking of a couple of other things. The the water above the firmament. We're seeing these things now. We we have the technology. We um, there was a video I had this morning showing the North Star Polaris, and it it fluctuates and flutters. It looks like you're looking through water at this this star what we've been taught what we've uh, been shown in the media is animation it's fantasy it's built lie upon lie as you were saying but now that the technology is there we're able to see for ourselves, and and then we get you know, well, it's because of the atmosphere. But, you know, the, the, everything that we're, we're shown is just a falsehood. It's uh, an elaborate hoax. They can't even turn around the camera on the ISS. Right. So there's just, there's no way to compare what we're actually seeing ourselves now with our own eyes to what, you know, I think that NASA employs a, a, a a gallery of science fiction writers. Right. So it, one thing, there was another story that I had no idea about because people wonder, well, you know, how could so many be in on this? Uh, it was a, a video about gravity and uh, gravitation, uh, the gravitational wave. And there was a, an injection test, they called it, that only the very top, Echelon, like there were four people, even knew about the um, researchers, all the people who were involved with this uh, research, which recently came out. We've discovered two black holes colliding. Well, they did a, a few years earlier what they called an injection test, and they wrote about this. But these things don't get wide play. It's it's like um, our finding the. Um, article about the plasma shield, 7,200 miles high. I don't know if it's really that high, but they put this information out. So this was showing how a very select number of elite are controlling the uh, majority of the researchers and, and hoaxing them. They believe that they had found, you know, what they've come out now and say they found. Who's to say that that wasn't? you know, another test. They did the recent one right after they moved into their new hundreds of million dollar facility. Obviously they had to show that they were doing something 
for all that money. Okay, I know what you're talking about. You were, um, it was that um, the huge, uh, I forget exactly, but I think it was like lasers and mirrors, and they had set up this whole um, this whole detection system in order to check for abnormal Proving pulses. Gravity. Yeah, yeah, the gravity waves that they were trying to, yeah, right. to, to and that yeah, and that they inserted this false. Basically, it was a hoax, um, and the scientists thought all of that was real, and right. they began to write all of these scientific papers, and then come to they find even, out they right. had inter- injected this, yeah, and that it was all a hoax. They even wrote a white paper, I think, and, and they went to a conference, and they were going to give it, and then that's when they were told that it was just, you know, and inje- you know, they used words like, well, this was just an injection, but they they falsified it. For them, so you know that's that's what is that's what goes on, and and so it's difficult to think that it wouldn't happen in any other environment. Right. So you, yeah, and you, imagine if they didn't tell them, you know, that it was a hoax. Exactly, and so then when they just released it, I think it was early this year. Who's to say that that wasn't as well? Right. Exactly. Their whole yeah. purpose for that is to quote unquote prove gravity, right. prove. Uh, Einstein's theory correct because they yes. need it, you know, and and every day I see more and more, you know, on top one on top of another article about they've discovered this in space, they've discovered that, and there's really no there there. But you know, people are and I was one of these. I loved all the space stories. Planet Nine. Oh, that must be Nibiru, you know? Right, right. And, yeah. and I'd be sharing that. We tell on Tribulation now, I'm sure they still are. But it's it's really not. It, there's nothing verifiable about that. It's not real science, although people will you know claim that it is. It's not. You can't verify it. Right. Yeah. And and there's so much of that out there now, you know. And um, and so that's why I, an, another reason I opened my book with, you know, just not believing and doubting um, all that NASA says because of the whole thing, you know. With the Apollo 11 missions and how they have been caught trying to perpetuate that the Earth is a sphere by utilizing the window of the lunar module in order to uh, give it that particular shape. I mean, right. and if the Earth was a, a ball and was a sphere, why would they have to hoax it at all, you know? I've really uh, latched on to what Charles Harler has said about the court case. Right. If, if there's any uh, falsehood going on, you have to throw everything out. And I used to try and validate things after studying the flat Earth. I uh, tried to validate things by, of NASA. But I don't know why I should be. <laughs> because if anything is false, I, I need to throw it out. And it is. It's demonstrably false. But we've absorbed this and been fed this for so many years, the moon walks, the moon landings, it's it's all false. Or, you know, if, if not all of it, a good, you know, there's a small portion that might be true. Even the satellites, there's no satellites. There's weather balloons. There's balloons. There's drones that can fly. There's so many ways that they can do that. And they've never shown satellites in space. And they're not in space. You can... You can pull it apart in so many ways, and it's just not feasible to try and validate them. And I should not be, because Charles is right. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. And the fact that there's been so – we've caught them lying and hoaxing so many things. Uh, You know, the the scuba tanks and the ISS, the spacewalk footage, the air bubbles, uh, the – the green screen where it just completely earth just completely disappears to a green screen. I mean, all of that sex in the clouds yeah, and, yeah. and the moon fly by right? they did it two years in a row. Now it's the most ridiculous looking right? thing, but people are so n- dumbed down 
that there will be replies on a post on a NASA Twitter feed that, oh, yay. I mean, it's just so wonderful. This is so marvelous. What a great thing you've done. Uh, they look at this and they believe it. And it's just impossible for me to see anymore. Even the sun. I mean, I, you look at the sun in, in the sky and it's not that far away. Right. The moon, I'm, the moon is luminescent in its own right. It is not reflecting yes, off, the, right. off the sun. I mean, these are so many things all my life that I've just accepted and not looked into, for mm -hmm. one. And now if I do, I can see tail on tail just spinning, trying to, um, you know, keep the illusion alive. Right, right. Yeah, and there's a, a portion of my book where I talk about how um, the the Sefer Yitzhara, the book of creation, it talks about there being seven planets uh, in the universe, and, and but the Earth is not listed in one of those, one of those, and the Sun and the Moon, and then Jupiter, Venus, Mars, uh, Mercury, and Saturn that those are these seven um, planets. And, and so it, you know, the sun and the moon are included with these particular, um, these uh, heavenly bodies. But they talk about also in the book of Enoch that there are, are seven levels of heaven and that each one of these celestial luminaries is hold circuit, a, a, a revolution on that particular level of heaven and that there's, you know, that they're not like everybody believes all of these planets move in circle around the sun. And I no longer buy into that either. Um, because again, if the sun, if I, cause I know it's not 93 million miles away and I know it's not as large as we have been led to believe, you know, um, NASA says that, the sun holds 99.86% of the mass of the solar system, and yet I know that the Earth is much larger in proportion than either the sun or the moon or any of the uh, celestial luminaries. And so um, I no longer even buy into the whole, you know, the perpetuation that all of the planets are moving in circle around the sun. Um, and so, you know, according to the book of Enoch, he says that each one of them is contained in their own revolution, in their own portion of the heavens, um, and that they do not intrude on one another, that they all move in circle around Polaris as the fixed star of the celestial sky dome. And the time-lapse photography, in my mind, affirms that as being an authentic statement i yeah i think you can take the time lapse photography so many other things that we're finding and then people like brian mullins who explains you know the different areas of the atmosphere and, and how it just wouldn't possibly work going through the thermosphere so I, all of that's really helpful in so many areas there's so many disciplines that we start to to look at to understand and try and uh, marry that up with what we see what we actually see can i read this one uh paragraph from chapter? okay good from chapter seven which is the ferment of heaven this one really really spoke to me god has his throne and seat of power directly above the highest point of what is the exact center of the vaulted dome of the earth and though this knowledge has been stolen from us I will in chapter on the throne of God restore to you this knowledge and elaborate fully upon this as concept. However, until then, keep in mind that just as the celestial luminaries revolve in circumspect around Polaris, the fixed star, so do the cherubim, seraphim, and openin angels in similar manner surround in worship at the feet of the Most High God as he sits upon his throne of glory. This should tell you something as to where his throne is located. God does very much indeed sit atop the circle of the earth upon the vaulted sky dome, as is referenced in the varying biblical translations of Isaiah 40:22, and that from there he looks down in observance upon the full extent of the earth 
as wide circular plains spread beneath and before him. Yeah, that's an amazing <laughs> revelation. I mean, you know, now that I understand that, uh, God's throne very literally is right above Polaris, that he is sitting on the very top of the vaulted dome of the earth. And Something else I got from that, and maybe I visualized the angels going around circular yes. worshiping. Yes. That, I, I saw that and I right. thought, oh my gosh, I see what Satan has done here. He's tried to steal God's throne. Yes, exactly. And, and yes, uh, go ahead. Just stealing it from humanity. Right. You know, he didn't, he can't steal it from God, but he's stolen it from us. Right. And he's made us um, lose this as understanding. And in, in doing so, he separated us from having an intimate and deep and profound relationship with the Most High God and knowing that he is right there beyond the reach of stars, above the clouds, right above Polaris, seated on the very top of the firmament, and that he is narrowly focused on the happenings and the occurrences of our world because there are no other games in town. We are all that is going on. This is it. Life here on the earth, all with us as being his special creature, being created in his image, and all of the other creatures that he is narrowly focused on watching and observing and and also guiding and leading uh, all of the occurrences here to a certain prophetic end. And it's just, it's absolutely mind blowing. And, you know, cause we are his bride and we are the prodigal child and uh, it just restores such uh, intimate relationship um, with our maker. When you come to understanding on all this, it's really profound. And I think it means a lot to Christians who haven't understood that when they can grasp that. And it means a lot to people who just, who maybe are looking at uh, Christianity and, and the Bible from a new perspective for the first time. I mean, you can, you get an entirely different understanding and perspective. So I just, I re that really was amazing to me, especially imagining that the angels are worshiping God in that way. Yes, and just as we see um, reflected in time-lapse photography with all of those stars moving in circle around Polaris, that, to me, they represent the cherubim, the ophanim, and the seraphim, and the angels yeah. in worship around the Most High God. And so, yeah, it's a deeply profound revelation. Uh, I want to read really quick a passage uh, Karen put in the chat room. Above the sides of the north, the city of the great king, which means turn your back to the sun when you pray, Psalms 48. In my next book, the eight chapters that I had to take out, I explain how the sides of the north are actually referencing, because when you come to understanding on the directions, the north is where it connects. If you have like the walls of the firmament rising in arch towards the very north the size of the north is the very center of the vaulted dome of the earth and that's where the firmament connects together in central um union and so that's where the most high god has established the heavenly temple and his throne is right there uh, above the north pole and above polaris and that is where the sides of the north is. And so in this next book, which I'll be working on that sometime very soon, it's um, been mostly formatted and mostly written, so I should be able to get it out uh, within a couple months. Um, and so I will be elaborating in very great detail on New Jerusalem and its connections to the sides of the north, Jacob's Ladder and its connection to the sides of the north, Paradise, uh, the Garden of Eden, Shield. I mean, there is so. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a, absolutely, it's a mind blowing revelation as well. Um, and what Job talks about as hell lying exposed, um, being naked beneath, 
uh, there's a vortex at the very north pole, which leads both up into her- uh, heaven and paradise and down into Sheol and hell, um, that this vortex is the Jacob's ladder that he saw the angels ascending and descending upon. And it's only there in the sides of the north uh, where Lucifer hints in Isaiah 14 um, that the throne of God is located. You know, when he said that um, that um, the God's throne is above the stars of God, above the clouds, um, and above the mount of the congregation. And the mount of the congregation is also um, located in the sides in the north. And I will explain how this mountain is also connected to uh, Yeshua being taken up to a very exceedingly high mountain oh, wow. and shown all the kingdoms of the world. Because being in the very center, uh, you know, at the North Pole and the very center of the Earth's circular plane, that it would make sense that he could see in equal distribution on all sides all the kingdoms of the world laid out in in surrounding uh, the Mount of the Congregation. And so all of that is huge revelation as well. So then your book after that can be on the no forests on the flat <laughs> Well, actually, after that, I've got to finish Lucifer, Father of Cain, too. Okay. And, and then after that, we'll see. <laughs> um, and I did want to mention for folks on Tuesday, August 9th, Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole, which is D-I-T-R-H on YouTube, they have a roundtable scheduled. I'm not sure what time, but there's a bunch. Mark Sargent's going to be on there, Patricia Steer, uh, Mark Weiss, Geo Shifter, Antonio Suberitz. So it'll be really interesting. They're going to take questions in the chat room. Cool. So it'll be all on this No Forest on the Earth. Oh, Topic. wow. Very cool. That is yeah, maybe cool. you'll come. <laughs> yeah, I'll check it out. Just uh, send me a reminder and I'll, I w- I'll listen for sure. I will do sure. that. Okay, thank you so much. I really, I'm so enjoying your book. Thank you so much. And where can people get it? Uh, you're welcome. And I did post a link. Um, I just released it. And so I will post a link in the chat room again to it. Uh, let me see. Um, before the end of the show, I will do that. And... Um, and also, one other thing, um, I will be working on, as soon as I get the word from the Thracian Church, as far as the Thracian Chronicles, that's another endeavor that I will be completing and finishing as well, because I do have most of that book written and uh, completed as well. I'm just waiting for the um, the Is okay Atom? to release that. Yeah, the Book of Atom, Atom and Ua, Ua and the Chronicles of Longinus oh, and, wow. the, and the Book of Navi. Oh, wow. Yeah, so all of that's coming too as well. God bless all. I'll post this link in just a minute. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, all. God bless all. Good night. <laughs> 